Hello. Okay, so I've been working on this and practice it. I think I've got it right. Uh, I got a little magic trick to show you. Watch this. I can make myself oh, disappear. You ready? One, two, three. Ooh, look, I disappeared. You can't see me anymore. I know, is that a basic? I know, I watch. Okay, one, two, three. And I'm back! Oh, I know. Uh, Jackson, I know in particular you're going to be thoroughly unimpressed and tell me about it, but, um, you know, I don't care. So, okay. Um, today's lecture is on the Jovian planets. So, this is, uh, we talked about the terrestrial planets last time. So now we've got the Jovian planets. They are the four big gas planets that uh, are beyond the asteroid belt, so the four terrestrial and the four jovian. So, start with Jupiter. Okay. Um, really, the gas planets, I mean, if you want to look at it, are not all that complicated. They're basically big balls of gas, um, and that's, uh, you know, not really oversimplifying it. I mean, that's kind of what they are. Um, so, general info on information on Jupiter, its composition is 90% hydrogen and 10% uh, helium. And they think that this is the same composition that probably the nebula that the whole uh, solar system formed out of is basically that composition. And this is not too far off of what the composition of the rest of the universe is. Um, the vast majority of the universe is hydrogen and helium. Um, all the other stuff we know about is at trace elements. So most of it is that. Um, so, uh, other little things. It is oblate, which means that it is wider at its equator than it is at its pole. And that comes from the fact that it's a gaseous ball that's spinning pretty quickly. Um, it rotates uh, once about every nine hours, 55 minutes. So it's spinning pretty quick for a huge planet, and that causes the middle of it to kind of expand out. So got this planet rotating really quickly. Well, here along the, the middle of the planet, there's going to be a force that is going to be pulling out. As that gas is spinning, that centripetal force is going to push it out, which makes it wider at its, uh, wider at its middle. So, um, so it's wider at middle. And that is due to it being gaseous and its fast rotation. Uh, nine hours, 55 minutes. So it goes around pretty quickly. Um, another weird fact about Jupiter, uh, it actually radiates more energy than it gets from the sun. Radiates more energy than receives from sun. Okay, and and part of this is like you might think like, oh my God, it's supposed to be super hot. It is not really super hot. Uh, the sun is that far away that it's pretty weak. The amount of radiation it gets. And Jupiter is still fairly warm, but if you were in the orbit of Jupiter, you would actually get more energy coming from Jupiter than you would be from the sun, because the sun is really, really far away. So we're getting out to, what was it, like 16 AU, I think, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it's about 16 AU or so, out from the sun, that is 16 times farther away than the sun is. It's, I mean, the earth is, it's really far away. So you're not getting a whole lot of, um, 
uh, uh, energy. What accounts for some of that energy? Uh, they think it's actually still heat from when Jupiter got compressed. It hasn't completely cooled off. It's still radiating heat from mashing up all those particles together and it, it being compressed and, and hot. Um, and some of it might be that it's heated up by the solar wind. So the particles that, that are hitting it from the sun are heating it up. They're not e exactly sure. Um, Another little kind of factoid about it, it has an extreme magnetic field. Um, in fact, the magnetic field actually reaches all the way out to Saturn. So um, it is 20,000 times stronger than Earth. And it reaches Saturn. Now, not all the time, it reaches out to Saturn's orbit, so it reaches out that far. So it is extremely um, strong. Okay. Um, now, uh, I'm going to go on to some pictures. But, pause and jump over there and set it up. I know. Somebody hit the card. Let's see if I can readjust this. Okay, well, so where does that go if I hit? These two collectively are referred to as the gas giants because they're more similar, as you can see. And then these two refer to the ice giants. Um, and obviously, because you can see that they're more similar to each other. Um, so uh, although they're more similar to each other, you can actually kind of subdivide them up. Um, hey, in comparing the two of them, which we'll, we'll get to uh, in a minute, um, Basically, as I said, these are these are just rocky. I mean, these are just gaseous planets. And I know it's kind of interesting here. They say if you if you were to drop into uh, Jupiter, the, the first thing you would hit would be like an atmosphere like ours, and you feel you know gas is pushing up against you. But then, as you sank through here, the gases would become so dense that they would start to act like a liquid, um, and in some ways, it would feel like a liquid. Now, it's not that it became a liquid, it's just that the pressures are so great that it squeezes the gas together that it starts to behave like a liquid. And then it actually starts to behave like a metallic liquid. And it's not that it starts to you know, get shiny and look like a metal, it starts to have properties of a metal, which, you know, for instance, would be one like conductive. Um, so it has the properties of metal uh, the more the chemical properties of metal as opposed to the shiny looking uh, property. Um, and then they think that there, there may be a rocky center, although I have recently heard that they believe there isn't, um, in that whatever material has fallen into there, the solid material is actually probably as a liquid. It is not a solid. It is either too hot to be a um, uh, solid. And so they are basically um, the same. Now, out on uh, the ice giants, um, part of the reason they're called, they're called that is that they have, they're colder, it's farther out, and they have ices in their atmosphere. So they have um, water, ammonia, and methane ices uh, up in their atmosphere before you get to, uh, so, I mean, uh, in there. So they're not as, as warm. Okay, so Jupiter, 
Now, one of the things that you probably noticed uh, about Jupiter is that we can see the weather patterns on Jupiter. Um, and if you notice, you've got these bands of weather that move around uh, on the surface of, uh, of Jupiter. And the probably most noticeable feature is the, the great red spot, which is actually very similar to a hurricane on Earth. And I do believe that it is actually getting smaller currently noticeably smaller over the last several years, reasons they don't understand. Um, but this is a giant um, storm that's been circling ever since Galileo first saw it with the telescope. The glowing that you're seeing up here is actually the auroras from the magnetic field that uh, Jupiter has. So the particles that have been hitting the magnetic field accelerated down the, the field lines until they hit the atmosphere, and it's got rather dramatic which unsurprising, rather dramatic um, auroras because of the size of the particles that we collect and the power of that, that field to create those. Um, so there's another picture, I think, which has a better um, contrast, but we can see the swirling gases. Now, this sort of weather pattern is probably happening on all of the other planets but we can see it on Jupiter because of the kind of lack, yeah, lack of methane that it has. The other plants have higher methane contents and methane is a very opaque gas, so it, it makes it hazy and we can't see it. Um, when we look at Saturn, you, you can see the, the, the contrast there, but this has a, a clearer atmosphere, so we're able to see what the gases are doing and how the weather pattern um, is moving and so you've got these bands which talk about weather you've got a convection cycle and you've got gases rising up gases sinking and then due to the Coriolis effect kind of curves them so you get these bands of gases traveling in uh, different directions so we can see those weather patterns and because there's no features on Jupiter because it is just gas and there's no uh, trees or mountains or anything the, those weather patterns are uninterrupted, so they can just basically circle around uh, without, you know, hitting anything, any friction. So they're pretty much stable and set up, although you will see them swirl a little bit as they interact with each other. The darker gases represent cooler gases, the lighter gases represent warmer gases. So that contrast, is, and again, this is all pretty cold um, for us. I mean, it would be a temperature we would so, but it basically just swirls around. Um, Jupiter also has a ring around it. It is a very uh, thin ring. It is made up mostly of uh, smoke-sized particles. Um, in fact, we didn't know that, that Jupiter had one until I believe it was Voyager uh, went past it and detected it. it is, they're extremely hard to see. And there are a couple of moons that are actually in the rings. Uh, and talk a little bit about how uh, rings form. Um, really, I have to say, what is probably the more interesting thing of all of these uh, planets uh, are their moons. Uh, the gas plants themselves are not uh, that interesting. I mean, because there's just big gas plants. We're never going to land on them. Um, they're just kind of big balls of gas, you know, uneventful. Um, but the moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto are really what hold, I think, are really the more interesting uh, uh, features of these planets. And so let me catch up before we get into each of these uh, moons. So come on back with me. Yep, wrong way. There we go. Ah, there we go. Okay. So, Atmosphere. 
So uh, it is relatively clear, and that is due to the low methane uh, in the atmosphere. So the methane is actually what makes it, uh, the other planets hazier so we can actually see. The atmosphere, uh, and I know this gets a little technical, but the atmosphere as we would think of it is about a uh, thousand miles uh, down before then it starts to uh, turn into uh, more of a, an opaque uh, pressurized liquid. Um, so farther down, you're, you're starting to, to have it be less of a classic gas and more acting like a liquid. So uh, past that, it is compressed. into uh, a liquid. So, but getting back to, to the atmosphere, um, you're gonna see that, as I was talking about, it's got bands of weather across it. And um, the reason that you get the, the different bands moving in different directions is that, um, you know, at the equator, and you get the pole, you understand the equator is warm, so if I did this on the side here, you'd have gases rising up. The pole would be cold, so you would have, here at the pole, you would have gases sinking. Okay, that has the, the possibility to set up a convection cycle. So you would have gases that would be traveling up here to sink, and then this would travel down around here. And you got this convection cycle going around as you have hot, place where it's hot, it's sink. But if you look at this, you're not going to take all the gas that's here and jam it up into the to the point of the pole. And so what happens is the gases that come up here, they start to spread out. Uh, they actually start to cool and jam up because I've got all this, you know, air smashing up here. So it, it actually, when it gets to about here, jams up, sinks down, that spreads out. And so I get a convection cycle here, this spreads out, starts to heat up, rises up, spreads, and then I get a convection cycle going the other way. So, uh, kind of highlight this. I've got a convection cycle going this way, and this convection cycle is going the other way, because they're like gears of wheel, where they're touching, they're going in the same direction. So where you've got, you know, gears touching, they have to, because if this one is going down, this one would have to go down too, because they'd have to go the same direction where they're touching together. So it's kind of a same principle there. And so you have these, these cells repeated over. Now, what happens then on the surface due to uh, the Coriolis effect, so I've got so from here, I've got gases going down the surface. So they're going, as you can see, they're going here to there to go up. Well, because it's a rotating body, and as you have something passing over a rotating body, it's going to actually curve it. That's called a Coriolis effect. Um, and this will curve things. So if this is rotating, if I've got the planet rotating this way, it's going to curve to the right. So these things are going to be curved this way. And so the net effect is, because of that, I have a weather pattern in this particular area where the weather's moving this way. Now here it's going up, gets curved to the right, it's going this way. So weather moves that way, weather moves this way, you've got these alternating bands of, of, of weather on there. Same thing happens on Earth. Um, that's why we have the westerlies which we are predominantly in, why our weather comes from the west. And then you have the trade winds, which come from the east. So it's the same. But the bands, where you get this rising up, this is going to be light colored, because this is where you've got air rising up. And this is going to be dark, where it's cold and sinking down. And so that's where you get the different colored layers, as you see where you've got warm uh, gases rising up, cold gases sinking down. So it gives you the. Um, uh, thing. So, oh, and uh, great red spot.
So this is a uh, basically a giant hurricane. Hurricane type storm. So okay. Um, the interior, as I as I mentioned on there, uh, you're going from a gas to a liquid to a uh, metallic liquid um, as you go in. And it's just because it's just greater and greater and greater and greater pressure, which makes the, the gas behave differently, start to ask as a liquid, then start uh, as a metallic liquid. Um, rings. Jupiter has rings. Um, all of the gas planets actually have rings. Um, and how the rings form, so all Jovian planets have them. Okay, so they all form inside something called the Roche limit. And the Roche limit is an area away from a planet. Yeah, I think I need to get a better marker. It looks like things aren't showing up so well. There we go. Okay, so the Roche limit is the distance away from a planet you have to go before the gravity. Okay, so if I've got a, uh, I know I'm bad about not finishing my thought. So the Roche limit is how far you have to go away from a planet uh, to get away from the gravity of that planet so that the gravity of your objects that you, that you have would, would form together. So let me just say, if I've got a bunch of particles out here, the gravity between these particles would be strong enough that they could actually form into uh, a moon or something. In, if it's inside the Roche limit, the gravity from the planet, the, the gravitational pull there is not going to allow them to form into a, a planet. So outside the Roche limit, you're far enough away from the gravity of a planet that you can, that the particles or whatever you have will form uh, on their own into something. Inside this Roche limit, this is strong enough. So all of the rings from these form inside this Roche limit area. Um, now, how does that stuff get there? Well, most of these, uh, well, all of these uh, planets have multiple moons. Um, so, you know, uh, Jupiter has 63, Saturn has uh, 49 at least. Neptune has six, Uranus has 27. So you've got an awful lot of moons. Those moons are being hit and struck by stuff. And the debris that comes off of the moons drifts towards uh, the planets and gets pulled into the, the Roche limit and circles around. Those rings are slowly orbiting and falling down towards the planet. So all of the stuff that you have in here slowly circles around and falls in. If you don't replenish those rings with material, they will disappear. Now, Saturn is different in that Saturn has got all the other planets. Saturn has ice that probably came from a uh, ice moon that was uh, obliterated. And that the, the particles then swirls are swirling around Saturn. The other planets just have these little basically dust uh, that is circling around that was blown off from the planets and it's slowly disappearing. Um, the rings of Saturn are actually slowly disappearing too. And we just might be lucky enough that we came about when the rings were most visible, that that planet maybe blew up or that moon maybe was crushed or destroyed, uh, you know, 20,000 years ago. And we're just able to see the remains of it, but they think in another 20,000 years or so, you know, a short time astronomically, the rings will eventually all fall into Saturn and disappear. So, um, 
Okay, so these these rings are mostly um, mostly dust from moons, and they're inside the Roche limit. Just going blue. Now there are some moons that are inside the Roche limit, um, as I was showing you before, and that kind of disturbs and messes up the, the rings. It's most noticeable in Saturn. That's what gives those little dividers in the ring to make it look like a record. Uh, it's the interaction of the gravity between uh, the rings and Saturn and the moons. It just pushes and pulls things and puts them in a different order. Okay, so moons. Jupiter has 63 moons in uh, roughly in three groups. Most of the uh, moons are just captured objects. There are four kind of true satellite moons, and then there are a couple of them that are really close that are actually broken up little moonlets that are, that are extremely close to, to Jupiter, which in a astronomically short period of time will be sucked up by, by Jupiter. The ones that we're interested in are the four Galilean satellites, which are true moons, in that they're, they're basically, you know, uh, in that sense a moon is, is kind of like thinking it's like a mini planet. I mean like our moon, it's round, it is its own object, it's not a broken off piece of something, it hasn't you know, fully formed into something. It has enough gravity to make itself spherical. So, the four Galilean moons. Okay, and those are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Okay, so go over here because the pictures are more interesting and we'll talk about those two. Boop. Okay. Okay, so Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto in order out from uh, Jupiter. Um, and if you look, that is an actual picture of the distance they are away from. Uh, from Jupiter. So, and if you have a pretty decent telescope, if you see Jupiter uh, at all, you can see the, the, the four little dots uh, of these moons, uh, like um, Galileo did. Um, okay, so first one is really stinking ugly. This is Io, and Io is covered in sulfur. And it has, and I, I don't know if we can see, I think maybe these red marks are the uh, eruptions at the time. It is a very active moon. Um, Io is close enough to uh, Jupiter that Jupiter's gravity is actually pulling. Um, it's tidally stretching uh, Jupiter's face. Meaning, so if, if Jupiter were over here, the gravity um, on the side facing Jupiter is strong enough that it actually pulls it out. And then when it rotates away, that, get, that, that part gets pushed back. So every time that Io rotates around, the, the, the side facing Jupiter gets pulled out, and then when it goes away, it gets pushed back in. So it's constantly being stretched and pulled. Um, think of like a car tire on the ground. When you're driving your car tire, where it touches the ground, it's flatter. So the you know the, the tire on the side is 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 flat, and then when it hits the ground, it gets squished, and then it goes back to being flat around. It goes around and squished, and it goes around and it's squished. I mean, a tire after driving for a while, if you put your hand on it, it gets fairly warm because of the energy of being bent back and forth. Same thing happens to Io as its face is being stretched and pulled. It keeps cracking it. It keeps adding heat to it. So this is a very active planet. 
uh, very stinky planet since it's covered in sulfur and you know gives it that color. So um, other than that, it is you know not terribly interesting, but the, the poor planet is being tugged and pulled a lot. So, um, there is a picture of one of the eruptions off of the um, Io. So satellite was lucky. I mean the probe was lucky enough to take a picture and see that as the it lit up. And there is another picture here of one of the, the cracks on the surface and um, a volcanic eruption on the surface of Io. Okay. Next up, Europa. Now, Europa is extremely interesting to astronomers because Europa is completely covered in ice, and this ice is actually acts like uh, it's made of plates of ice, and those plates of ice act like the plates of ice on Earth. So, if you want to think of like Europa is similar to Earth in that, well, Earth has plates of rock. The plate tectonics are rock. This is the same sort of plate tectonics with ice, and so. If you look at the, the surface, what you have underneath the whole of Europa is what they think is a sea, so a saltwater liquid ocean. And then there's maybe, I think you think about 40 miles thick of ice. And so this is not going to be completely solid ice, but this is going to be kind of slush. And then the top is ice, and what they have here is the same sort of thing that's happening on Earth, but in this case it happens with ice. You've got these two plates of ice hitting each other, where they hit, one plate goes down, it melts, and that little warmer water kind of comes up and forms um, little ice volcanoes, or cryovolcanoes, and you have, you know, the warm water spill out and form uh, little, you know, newer lakes or little mountains of, of of water or of ice, where these hit, the plates actually crumple up and form mountains. So you get the same idea of the mountains we have on Earth, where the rock crumples together. But in this case, they're made out of, of ice. And then they've, they've even got little uh, features for as the plates slide over each other. So here's another um, uh, indication. Now, what else makes this, this really interesting is this moon might be the best chance to find life somewhere else in our solar system. Uh, because in this underwater ocean could possibly be life. Now, to keep this liquid, the uh, moon has to be still active. So it has a, a, a hot core and it probably has uh, regular volcanoes under here that are, that are steaming up and causing that ocean to stay warm. Now, I know some of you might think, well, how could you have life if in this ocean if it's completely covered over and there's no sunlight getting to it? Well, that's possible here on Earth. Down at the bottom of the ocean, they have found ecosystems that are completely cut off from the, the surface and uh, photosynthesis, and instead of having sunlight be the energy that the system uses, they, it's chemosynthesis. So it's the chemicals, the hot chemicals that come out of this vent that little organisms use to grow. So the plants, instead of using sunlight or using the chemicals out of the, uh, the vents, those plants are then the food for other animals, and then you've got your whole cycle built along that. That they found here on Earth and fenced down at the bottom of the ocean where no sunlight or where basically they are uh, detached from the surface. So if it's possible on Earth, it is possible that it's happening here. Now the difficulty with, with getting to that is you'd have to get through 40 miles of ice and then drop down and then start hunting around and that's way over on Jupiter, but it is tantalizing that it is possible that that exists out there. So, now here we've got little pictures, and this was one of these, you know, amazing moments uh, in discovery in their solar system. As I believe it was Voyager was passing by, it turned back to Europa to just take pictures. It was just taking pictures, and I don't know that they expected anything, but because 
of the position where this was with the sun, they were able to highlight these uh, cryovolcanoes, or basically these little water volcanoes shooting out, uh, jetting out ice. And here is another, uh, it's a picture of how a really warm spot has actually caused the surface to crack up and melt a little bit and get this kind of uh, crinkly feature on it. So. Um, the other interesting thing um, about uh, Europa is it has a magnetic field that reverses every five and a half hours. And they think that's due to the conductive salt water underneath, as that salt water is kind of orbiting around. It's messing with this magnetic field. So uh, if there's any life on there, I'm sure hope it isn't migratory, because having a magnetic field that switches like that would be awful confusing. Um, Okie doke. So, real interesting uh, planet to, to go look at. Ganymede. Um, Ganymede is interesting because it, it is the largest moon in the whole solar system. It is actually bigger than Mercury, um, but it is basically a frozen inactive ice ball. So the, the, the surface uh, and Again, one of the reasons they can tell the surface is old is because the number of craters on it, the more craters, the less it has been um, recycled. Whereas you go back and look at you know, the picture here of Europa, there's no craters on it, or very few craters. I don't think I can even see a crater on it. That's because that surface has been constantly renewed. So it's a very young surface. Whereas going back to Ganymede, this is a very old surface. And they think that it is possible that underneath this thick ice, ice crust might be an ocean, but then, you know, here you've got an ocean, then probably uh, another layer of ice, and then Rocky Mantle core. But this is this is cooled off. It is not as, as active as uh, the other. And then you've got Callisto, which uh, Callisto is the most cratered object in the solar system. And no, they haven't counted all the craters on it. What they have done is you know, take a sample, a little area, count the number of craters in it, and then multiply it by size to, to get an estimate of it. Um, but I like this picture because if, if you can see here, there was an impact here, and you can see the ripples across the surface as it goes out from this. So that was a whopping big strike uh, to cause all those ripples in the surface like that. And I don't know how clearly it comes out here. And I think that we're looking at this, from this impact here and the ripples that, that come around from that. So that was a uh, sizable smack. Okay, so that covers the moon. Io, really sulfury. Europa, possibility of life. It is an ocean underneath a, uh, an actively, uh, a geo uh, geologically active uh, ice crust. And then Ganymede and Callisto are just basically frozen ice falls. So, and most cratered. So, okie doke. That leads to Saturn. Saturn is a lot like Jupiter, similar in its composition, density, and rotation. Um, similar to Jupiter. Um, it's a little less dense. Its composition, a little bit lighter. Um, it has 96% hydrogen and 3% helium. So for whatever reason, it's a little less. It rotates a little slower. It's 10 hours, 39 minutes. Um, but it is actually a little more oblate because it's less dense, even though it rotates a little bit slower because it's, it's less dense, uh, its material pops out uh, a little bit more. Um, 
it also radiates more energy than it gets. And again, you're getting pretty far away from the sun, so it really doesn't take much uh, to radiate more energy than you get from the sun. Um, its um, magnetic field is weaker than Jupiter's, but it's still a thousand times stronger than Earth's. So, uh, and not sure exactly what causes that to be less. They don't know what's going on internally that would maybe have less of a dynamo to have that thing moving around. Um, so, and its atmosphere, because it has more methane, it is hazier and we can't see the same weather patterns that you would see in Jupiter. Um, so you have a, a difference there. So. That was it. Is it for, I wanted to do the freeze up, see if you guys would just go, hey, what, what's wrong? Bored. I know. Just, I should do it like an action pose, though. I need to go like, I don't think I could hold that for that long. So. Yeah, I wish I could like stutter too, or, oh, do the, you know, the mouth moving and then like saying the words. I got to practice that. like. I knew a kid who could, uh, I had a student who could do that. It was like move his mouth but say words at like different speeds. So, nah. Okay. Uh, okay, so it's got more methane, which makes it hazier. Makes it hazier. Okay. So, um, rings. Hey, the rings of Jupiter are made up of uh, ice. So this is ice chunks as large as buses. So most of it is smaller, but there are some rather large ice chunks. Um, they do think that, it, as I said, that it's a possibility that the rings have actually formed due to an ice moon, kind of like a, uh, uh, a Ganymede or a Calypso that actually like broke apart and the large arch chunks are just, you know, debris that's swirling around. Um, they are disappearing. Um, they are noticing it's, it's going away. And if it's not replenished, then the rings will go away. Um, Enceladus, one of the moons, is actually jetting off um, water eruptions like Europa does. So Enceladus does the same thing for um, Saturn, and it's adding to the to the rings uh, for it. And the the rings are actually um, spaced out due to the gravitational interactions of the moons and Jupiter. So. Uh, So it's formed possibly from a shattered moon. Um, and it's added to by water eruptions from so uh, I can't spell that. And so it is. So, um, okay. Well, let's take a look. Ah. Take a look at some pictures of that before we get to the moon. As you can see, and I don't, you know, the, if you look up at any of your own pictures, they're hazy, but you can see just faintly some patterns inside the weather. And uh, any more methane, and you would not be able to see it. Um, the rings here, as I said, the spaces in this rings have to do with the interactions, the gravitational interactions, which push and pull uh, the rings in, in different directions. It is 
rather dramatic. Here you can see the auroras at the bottom from its uh, magnetic fields. I'm sorry, I am tired. Um, actually, if you take a look at this, the, the rings, from what you really can see, there is there is even a farther out ring of dust. Uh, you know, they call the E rings. They're given letter names. Um, so, and um, yeah, I believe in the F ring. Yeah, they've got two moons here, uh, Prometheus and Pandora. Uh, I believe are inside that. Um, out here, you've got. Well, Enceladus. Oh, yeah, we're um, of the major moons. Uh, that's the I'm getting the wrong. wrong. I was thinking of Jupiter. Sorry. Okay. So there are uh, the divisions, uh, rings that, that space out. Again, I want to say in the Casino ring is a small. There is like a a, a small moonlet or a chunk. Is cleared out that area. Uh, comparing the um, oh, comparing the moons, uh, you can see that you have an obviously noticeably larger moon here in Titan. Um, Enceladus is a lot like Europa, uh, which we'll get to in a minute, and then you have um, Titan, which is another uh, extremely interesting. Uh, moon to Earth. So, Enceladus. In in a way, you could say this is a twin of Europa, and um, I, I might have actually switched some of the pictures. I'm not sure. It is kind of hard to tell the two of them apart since they are so similar. But here in this picture, you can start to see some of the plate boundaries where they're they're, they're cracks. There are some craters on uh, this, but for the most part, I mean, there really are very few. Uh, and that's because the surface gets uh, renewed. Okay. Another picture showing that the, the same basic idea is what's happening on Europa. You've got a global uh, ocean underneath uh, this ice sheet, um, hot core that is heating it up. Another picture here of, of some of the eruptions. And, and as I said, these eruptions here on Enceladus blast up. Um, some water that is actually floating over and forming uh, or adding to the rings of Saturn itself. Okay. Titan. Titan is of a, a lot of interest to astronomers um, because it has, it's one of the few planets, moons in our solar system that has features like Earth. So Titan actually has liquid lakes on it. It has mountains. It has sand dunes. It actually has weather patterns um, that, that occur. Um, it is extremely cold. Um, its atmosphere, I mean, the, the, the surface, the liquid lakes are methane and of uh, ethanol. So it's, you know, in the minus, you know, tens and hundreds of degrees. Uh, so that you're getting gases that would normally be gas here, cold, so cold they're liquid down there. But the, something happened in, in the formation of this that is similar to what happened through the formation of Earth. And because of that, astronomers want to study Titan to see, well, what is it that's similar about it? What is its difference? So is something that, like, say, how Earth formed, is that very common or is it unusual? Um, so. It, is, it has a, an atmosphere that's 10 times um, denser than Earth's, and it is rich in nitrogen. Um, you know, so studying that is to see, okay, is the composition even of our atmosphere something that is a, a common occurrence? You, know, you get those, those types of gases normally or not. Um, so uh, we have sent uh, a couple of probes to Titan. Um, so they have they have landed on it, gotten pictures of it, but um, it is a uh, rather interesting. Okay. So uh, they do think that it is it has a uh, strange kind of surface, so that you have an atmosphere, you then have kind of a, a of an ice shell 
uh, an ocean, then another ice shell, and then rock underneath it. So it's it's got kind of like it says here this decoupled ice shell. So it's got like a a shell over a, a shell. So you've got you know a ball with a solid ball rotating around anyway around on it. Um, that is an actual picture of the surface. So you've got kind of you know features like you would see on Earth, you know, mountains. Uh, you know, erosion, and, and it looks like the, the surface is being actively changed by the weather and by the planet itself. It is not just uh, you know, inactive and, and nothing is happening. Um, and so there's an artist's rendition of, uh, from one of the pictures as to what it looks like. So having lakes of, of methane or ethanol and then other features on it you know, does make it a, a, a pretty interesting uh, object. It is seven major satellites or true moons, and it has 47 total. Most of them are captured uh, dirty ice balls, so it's basically like a captured asteroid. Um, and of that, you have Enceladus. is like a Europa twin. And you have Titan. And um, Titan is of interest because it has um, an atmosphere like early Earth. And that is 10 times larger, though, than ours, or thicker than ours. Um, and the surface has Earth like features. Uh, you got lakes, mountains, dunes weather. So it is interesting in that regard to go study. Okay. Next one is Uranus. Okay, both Uranus and Neptune um, couldn't have formed out where they are. There would just not been enough material to make them bigger. In fact, they think that all the planets actually formed much closer into the sun. Um, and as they became bigger, the gravitational interaction of the planets actually pushed themselves, they interacted with each other, pushed themselves out to the orbits that they are. Probably the one that had the biggest influence is Jupiter. And Jupiter probably flung uh, Uranus and Neptune farther out uh, into the solar system after they had started to form and become bigger. And it is possible that, that Jupiter actually flung them out early and they didn't get to be as big as Jupiter and Saturn were. Um, okay, so it, uh, Uranus is about half the size of Saturn and about a third the size of Jupiter. Um, half Saturn, one-third Jupiter. Uh, its composition is a little bit different. Um, it is 83% hydrogen, 17% helium, and it is a higher methane content, and that methane, and it being farther out, the methane is in ice, and that methane makes it blue. 
And so that's why you get the blue color is that the methane ice Methane ice makes it blue. Okay. So what really makes Uranus interesting is the fact that it rotates on its side. Um, and its satellites are actually on the side too. So the whole thing got tilted over. Um, again, uh, most likely that has to do with the fact that uh, it was struck by some object early in its formation and tilted everything over. Um, so it does have um, 20, yeah, 27 moons. Um, they, uh, it has thin rings too. Well, we'll get to the pictures because it's hard. Not much is known about Uranus and Neptune. They're very far away. Uh, we've only done flybys of the planets. And so the pictures that we have are not very detailed, nor we send a mission just to study them. So a lot of what we kind of know about is theoretical. So there, a giant kind of featureless ball. There is lots of weather going on. It's just that we can't see it. Just methane spread out in the atmosphere is not allowing us to see what's going on inside. So with uh, and I believe these were taken like with infrared cameras. With infrared, we can start to see the very thin, incomplete rings that it has, a little bit of dust that it has, and that there are, you know, weather things happening beneath the surface. These are warmer spots. The so brighter spots are warmer, darker spots are cooler. And here's another picture, and it shows its rotation almost completely on its side, and there are the moons that it, it does have uh, that are going around in the same plane, which is the same plane with Uranus, not with the sun, which is kind of interesting. Um, Neptune. Uh, Neptune has, uh, I think they call it the great dark spot. So it has a storm that is similar to Jupiter's storm circling around it that is noticeable. Um, it has, by their estimation, watching the pictures, saying it has possibly the highest recorded winds in the solar system, I think of like six, 700 miles an hour, or the winds that are whipping around um, Neptune. Um, again, not much is known uh, about this. Um, it does, probably one of uh, Neptune's biggest features is that it has a strong gravitational effect on Kuiper Belt objects. So it pushes around uh, Pluto, the Plutinos, and actually it has a group of dwarf planets called the Neptinos, or something like that, that it is affected and kind of follow it around. Um, so here is showing some of uh, the moons that it, it has going around it. Triton is unusual in that it rotates uh, the opposite direction around. So it is possible that Titan is a captured uh, dwarf planet, uh, a Pluto-type object that just got captured by Neptune. Um, the orbit around uh, Neptune is extremely large, and it's the opposite, so um, yeah, so, and that's it. So uh, the pictures. Okay, so this has 27 moons. It rotates on its side. And it has very thin rings. Most likely if it had bigger rings, these rings have just slowly been disappearing. So it doesn't have any more material to to replace that. Neptune. Similar to Uranus. Uh, it is uh, has 
the gray dark spot, which is not, which is a storm, just like the great red spot. Um, highest winds. Six moons. Maybe two captured dwarf planets. Triton being one of them. I think maybe there's another one captured. Um, and it has incomplete rings. So that wraps up the solar system. Oh. No, it doesn't, because we have to talk about the sun. The sun's the last thing, yeah, because it's a star, and then that's our jumping off point to stars. So, uh, oh, bye. I'm gonna go over there, turn it off. <laughs>